You know, we talk about joy. We sang joy to the world. We like to think about joy at Christmas. We like to be joyful. We like to have happiness in our lives at Christmas. So all those things are important. All those things are good. But the sad truth is there's often a lot of tragedy associated with Christmas. On Christmas Day, just a few days ago this year, there were three teenagers in a rural Alabama town that were killed in an automobile accident. In 1996, Jominate Ramsey disappeared on Christmas Day. 1994, an Air France uh, flight was hijacked in Algiers. 1913, in Italy, there were striking mine workers who were invited to this theater to have a Christmas dinner. And during that Christmas dinner, someone yelled fire. And everybody began to run for the exits, and 73 people were trampled to death during Christmas <laughs> dinner. 39 of them children in 1913. And the sad truth is, in the midst of our joy and celebration, there is a lot of sorrow. And that is certainly what happened the first Christmas as well. And before we look at God's work, let's pause for a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can come and we can lift our voices in praise to you. That we can thank you for all that you have done for us in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we are also reminded today that in the midst of our joy, there is much suffering. There are lives that are broken. There is hurt that is too deep to express. Lord, we are a people who need you. And as we look into your word today, as we look at a text, as we look at a passage, as we think about a day that we would just as soon not have to think about, Lord, I pray that you would teach us through your word. And I pray that you would transform us by the power of your spirit working with your word. Lord, I pray that we would understand why Jesus came. And that we would give our hearts and lives to him. It's through him that we pray. Amen. Amen. We're in Matthew chapter 2. Let's begin reading in verse 12. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed. They, the wise men, departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old or younger according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Rome, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. As we look at Matthew's conclusion of the birth of Jesus, we are just slapped in the face by the fact that the babies are executed. You see, Herod has been tricked. Herod told the wise men, you go and find Jesus and come back and tell me, I want to worship him too. This worshiping Jesus sounds like a good thing. I'd like to do that. And so you just come on back. You see, Herod was trying to trick the wise men. But instead, thanks to the power of God, the wise men tricked Herod. They understood in a dream that they needed to go back a different way, and so they departed. And when Herod realized, these guys have got to be gone by now, they aren't coming back to see me. Herod is just mad. You see, the way things work in Judea in the first century is what Herod says, that's what you do. He is a very powerful king. You don't ask questions. You don't think about it. You don't delay. When Herod says do it, you do it. And these wise men didn't do what Herod said. And so Herod doesn't like being tricked. He doesn't like when people don't do what they tell him to do. And he's also concerned about this baby who would be king. 
Because Herod wants to protect the kingship for himself. And so Herod decides he needs to take matters into his own hand and he creates this edict that all of the male children in Bethlehem and in the surrounding region under the age of three will be killed. He used what information he had with the magi had given him. He said, uh, we're going to make sure we get, we're going to make sure we solve this problem. All baby boys under the age of three are going to be executed. And he carries out that plan. See, that's, that's the kind of evil that existed that Jesus came in the world to change. That's the kind of evil that was in Herod's heart. Herod had no problem killing babies. Herod would even kill his own children. In fact, he did. He was concerned that they were trying, going to overthrow him and take the throne from him, so he had them killed. Now, Herod himself claims to be a Jew, so he can be king of the Jews. He's not really a very good Jew, and the Jews hate him, but he claims to be a Jew, so he doesn't do things that are under the Jewish law, like he doesn't eat pigs, doesn't eat pork. And so there's a joke that goes around in Rome, in, in the, all the Roman Empire, they all know this, during Herod's day, it's better off to be one of Herod's pigs than one of his children. Because he won't kill his pigs, but he will kill his children. And so it's not a big leap for Herod to say, well, I'm going to make sure I deal with this problem with a sledgehammer. I'm just going to kill any baby under three, any baby boy under three that's in or around Bethlehem. Now, understand, we're probably looking at about 12 to 20 kids. Okay, it's not a, a huge number of kids because he knows where the baby was born and roughly the time and that sort of thing. So sociologists tell us that it, it's probably in the neighborhood of 12 to 20 kids. But still, there's 12 to 20 families that have their baby ripped out of their arms and executed because of Herod's jealousy. Jeremiah's prophecy was fulfilled in Herod's act. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15 says this, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted by her children. Because they are no more. Jeremiah predicted that there would be great weeping among God's children, among the people of Israel in the day when the Messiah came. And he likened it to, to the days of Rachel. You see, there was a time when it looked as if both Rachel's children, Benjamin and Joseph, had died. And the family was grieved during that time. And that's the kind of grief that will befall the people of Israel when the Messiah comes. Now I want to remind you that Joseph and Benjamin, when they thought they were dead, neither one of them were. And it's a reminder that God can protect these 12 to 20 babies. We don't know who they were. We don't know the families. But God did. God knows every one of those babies. He knows the number of hairs on their head. And I'm reminded when David's baby died, how David said that he can't come to me anymore. That baby can't come to me, but I, I will go to him. And we believe that God has the power to protect those who aren't old enough to understand their accountability before God. We believe that God has protected these babies, but still there's much weeping in those days among their families. There's a lot of hurting. And also I want to point out the wording in verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Contrast that with the words of verse 15. And they, the family, Jesus' family remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken. And in chapter 1 of Matthew, verse 22, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. There's an understanding in the birth narrative of Matthew and, and throughout the book of Matthew that God is so ordaining circumstances to fulfill his prophecy, what he said would happen. But that's not what God says about the babies dying. Then it 
was fulfilled. It simply came to pass. You see, God knew what would happen. God likened their suffering to the suffering of Rachel during uh, her lifetime and the family of Rachel during their lifetime. But God wasn't in this making it happen. This is outside of God's will. This isn't like Mary conceiving. This isn't like Jesus going to Egypt and being called out of Egypt. This is not God's will. This is not something God wants to happen. This is not something that God ordained. This is simply God knowing the sin of man and knowing what would happen when the Messiah came. And you see, part of the sorrow of Christmas is that evil and death and suffering still exist. And in the midst of that suffering, while the babies are executed, Jesus escapes. God warns the Magi in a dream, and they go back another way. God sends an angel to Joseph who tells him, you go to Egypt. Get Mary and Jesus, go to Egypt, hide out in Egypt. Another prophecy was fulfilled in that. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 says... When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. It's a reminder that when God birthed the nation of Israel in captivity, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of death, in the midst of sorrow, that God called them out of Egypt to be a nation. And God said that in the midst of the suffering that is going on in the world, I sent my son, and I'm going to call him out of Egypt, that my salvation might reach the ends of the earth. But many people have pointed out that this passage just doesn't seem fair. God warns Joseph. God sends an angel to Joseph. And him and Mary and Jesus get out of there and get to Egypt. But the other 12 to 20 families, there's no warning. There's no angel. It's only death and sorrow. It just doesn't seem right. Couldn't God warn those people too? Couldn't God save those babies too? I mean, with all the suffering going on in the world and with all these situations, it just somehow doesn't seem fair. And in our day and age, when we talk about insider trading and, and how bad that is, and, and people go to jail for long periods of time when they have inside information and they use it to make a profit, isn't this somehow kind of like insider trading where God knows what's going on and he uses that information to help his son, but the other sons die? Part of the sorrow of Christmas is it from our perspective? From our 70-some-odd years of perspective, from our perspective this side of heaven, God doesn't always seem fair. Oh, I know that sometimes we know why suffering happens. But why my family? Why my friends? New Year's Eve, 35 years ago, my cousin Janie, was, who was a year and a day older than me, we were close growing up. Janie was driving home from work on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve, and she was going on a highway, a, a real busy highway, two-lane highway, uh, where people who live in the county next to uh, where Evansville is leave work from Evansville, and, and it's highly uh, traveled. Uh, coming in in the morning, going out in the evening. And a drunk driver coming into Evansville swerved out of his lane, into Janie's lane, hit her head on, and she was killed instantly. I know why Janie died. She got hit by a drunk driver. But in a line of traffic, why her? I don't know. It doesn't seem fair. And this side of heaven, I'll never know. And when we were growing up, Janie always called me her kissing cousin. I loved Janie. I thought she was the coolest thing ever. But I hated being called her kissing cousin. When you're 15 and your 16-year-old cousin introduces you as her kissing cousin, it just seems a little weird. 
But you know what? I, I'd give anything. If Janie was running around the church introducing herself to all of you. Oh, I'm the pastor's kissing cousin. Amen. 35 years later. It still hurts. I got nothing else in this, in this story. There's nothing else that pours out pages. That's it. That's how it ends. There's no hair struck by lightning. There's no army of angels who come down and zap him. That, that's it. It just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. I don't always have an answer for you. But I want to remind you, while Matthew's story of Christmas ends there, Matthew's story doesn't end there. And sometimes we have to pull back and take a bigger view of what's going on than just what we see right in front of us. And if you're looking through a telescope at the birth of Jesus, this doesn't seem fair. This ends wrong. But when you pull back and begin to see what God is doing and get a bigger picture, things begin to change. You see, the babies were executed and Jesus did escape. But ultimately, Jesus is executed. Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. And now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them once ran and, and one of them once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. No Elijah to save him. No coming down off the cross. Jesus, some 30 years later, would die on the cross. You see, that's what Jesus came to do. Amen. Matthew makes it clear in chapter 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life ransom for many. Jesus came to die. And if Jesus was born to die, then Jesus was saved when Herod killed the babies to die. Jesus came to die, he was born to die, and he was saved to die. Because you see, Jesus didn't come to escape death. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to eliminate death. Mm -hmm. right. John 3, 15 through 16 says it this way. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, God knew how evil Herod was. God knew how evil humanity was. God knew how evil we were. Maybe you've never killed a baby. Certainly never ordered the execution of a dozen or more. We've all sinned against God. We've all said, God, I'm worried about me. I'm worried about my position. I'm worried about what makes me feel secure, what makes me feel safe, what makes me feel happy. And I'm going to live my life and do my thing so that I can be satisfied with me, God. That's what sin is. Oh, we all have our different ways of doing that, but that's what sin is. That's what Herod did. That's what we did. That's what we do. And it's into that world that God sent Jesus. The consequences of our separation from the one who gives us life, from the source of all life, is death. When you cut yourself off from life, you have death. But God doesn't want us to. God is not content with that solution. And so he sent Jesus into the world to live a perfect life, to show us how we should live. 
and then to die on a cross. Not because he deserved to, not because he deserved death, because he didn't, but to take death for us. The Son of God took all of the sin of all of humanity of all of time, and he took it on his shoulders and died in our place so that we might be saved. I don't know how many of you had a real Christmas tree this year. We always get a real Christmas tree. But Christmas trees have a very sad life when you think about it. Come spring, all those Christmas trees that were cut down all over America, I, I understand they'll plant three trees for every one they cut down. And they'll plant these trees around, but they're planted to die. The average life expectancy of a Christmas tree is six to ten years. And then, actually, <laughs> and we'll put some lights on it and some ornaments and, you know, be happy about our dead tree in our life. You see, that's why Jesus came the first Christmas. He was born to die. To take sin and to take death. For us. And so while the babies are executed at the first Christmas and Jesus escapes, ultimately Jesus is executed and we escape. John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Seven times in the book of John, Jesus says, I am. I am the door, the, the way to get to the shepherd. I am the shepherd, and I take care of my sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And one of those I am sayings is, I am the resurrection. I am the one who gives you eternal Jesus came not just to have a life like we have, but to give us a life that we could never have. Mm -hmm. Eternal life in the presence of God. Jesus is the resurrection. Mm -hmm. You see, while the sorrow of Christmas is that evil still exists, and that sometimes we don't understand and God doesn't make sense and we can't figure out what's going on. The joy of Christmas is this. Someday, all of that death will be defeated. Amen. And someday we will escape death and we will be resurrected to be with him throughout eternity. That, folks, is the joy of Christmas. Thank you, Lord. Scripture says that all of us have sinned. It's not just a Herod thing. It's not just in Jesus' original genealogy, Tamar, David, and Bathsheba. It's all of us. And if we will admit that we've sinned against God, if we will believe that Jesus died on a cross for our sin, ask Him, repent of our sin, and ask Him to come in and be the Lord of our life, to be our God, to lead our life, which is the way God intended it from creation anyway. The Bible says we will be saved. And that salvation is offered to anyone who will accept it.